Praise the Lord. We rise up and commit ourselves to the Lord in prayer for the Bible study tonight. You want to pray that the Lord will reach out to you and teach us salient truths that you need to know and that the Spirit of God will apply these words to your very heart. That the Bible study will do good in your spiritual life, make you grow, strengthen you, empower you, enable you to be what you ought to be, preparing you for greater service in the Lord, preparing you for a holier walk, a closer walk, a closer fellowship and relationship with the Lord. Pray that your body will not drag back your soul. That the spiritual depths in the world will not be hidden to you. And every word that is said, every lesson the Lord is bringing out in His Word, become part of your spiritual life. The entrance of the Word giveth light. Pray that the light will receive. The enlightenment we receive in the word will show the spiritual path very clearly. So you'll walk in the right direction to please the Lord in every step of the way. Every decision you take. Pray that the Lord will grant you spiritual strength. As we take this food, spiritual food, the bread of life. Pray that these wonderful examples the Lord has been revealing to us week after week will make you to stand firm, stand erect, stand courageously. Your heart backbone to your Christian life. You'll not be like a jellyfish having straw for backbone, no strength, no courage, no conviction, moved, shifted, dreaming like chaff or the winds of circumstances. But that the word of God will grant you very strong, stable, solid stand. But this word will help you to grow. Pray that you'll not be stagnant. Staying in the same location spiritually. Having the same low temperature spiritually. Pray that the Lord will make you fervent, hot, pure, righteous, zealous in the things of the Lord.
In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Bible study once again tonight. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness because you're always with us. Lord Jesus, Savior, Redeemer, Lord, we thank you. Because we can trust in your promise where you said, where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there in their midst. And we, we welcome you tonight. And we pray, Lord, you grant us understanding in your word in Jesus' name. Spirit of the living God, the spirit of truth. We pray that the spirit of truth will so enlighten us and open up the pages of scriptures tonight that we'll have proper understanding of your word in Jesus' name. And that the truth we learn will enable us and energize us, empower us to be what we are to be in the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Lord, make us turn without wavering. Having faith in you, focus in your word, that all the time, every step we take, every decision we make, will be to please you in Jesus' name. Be glorified in every life, Lord. And let our lives attract other people to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We can sit down. I welcome every one of us to the Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. What a glorious thing to be together every time. And young people, what a new arrangement they have. They make our young people to see to the adults. Looks like that is promotion. They say don't stay low there. Be promoted and come with the adult people and sit down together. Where are the young people? Where are you? Can you raise up your hand? Young people, can you stand up so I can see you? Just to see your wonderful faces once again. Praise the Lord. I thought the adult church will welcome them and clap for them. Welcome you to the adult seat for our Monday Bible study. God bless every one of you richly in Jesus' name. We pray that your sitting with us will help us adults to see how serious you are taking in the word of God. Also, our fellowship with you as adults and young people will strengthen you and lift you up in the spirit in Jesus' name. Thank you. God bless you. I appreciate you. You can sit down. We're coming to a Bible study tonight in Daniel chapter 4. This Daniel chapter 4 is like a turning point in all that we have been studying in Daniel. Because here we find Nebuchadnezzar himself and Nebuchadnezzar is giving us his own testimony, first hand testimony of what happened to him. The Lord took him low before the Lord took him high. The Lord humiliated him before the Lord honored him. The Lord chastised him before the Lord cleansed him. You see, that is how life is. There is night before the day. There is poverty before prosperity. There is adversity before advance. And then there is suffering before you can have a kind of glory that God brings in your life. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar is telling us tonight. As we look at what he has to say, the experience he went through. Look at Daniel chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and the wonders that the high God has wrought toward me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion from generation to generation. I Nebuchadnezzar was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream. Do you notice something here? That it's like Daniel is allowing Nebuchadnezzar to talk for himself. Daniel knew, knew the whole story. He knew the whole testimony. He knew what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. But he said, Nebuchadnezzar, it, it, it will be sweet in your mouth. It happened to you. The rod of affliction... 
the rod of chastisement came upon you. And then the hand lifted you up after the chastisement and punishment. Therefore, you can tell it yourself. Talk about it yourself. That's why he said, I, in verse 2. And then he says, I, in verse 4. And then in verse 5, he says, I saw a dream which made me afraid. And the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me. And that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. And they were told in verse 8, But at the last Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar. According to the name of my God, in whom is the spirit of the Holy Ghost. Before him, I told the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, that is, master of the wise men of the Chaldeans, because I know that the spirit of the Holy Gods is in thee, and no secret troubles thee. Tell me the visions of my dream. That I have seen and the interpretation thereof. Those were the visions of my head in my bed. You know, I began to narrate the dream, that revelation. He began to narrate it unto Daniel so that Daniel will be able to have contact with God, connect with God. And so God will be able to reveal unto him the meaning. The significance and the implication of that dream. And so now he began to tell him, Those were the visions of my head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven. And a sight thereof to the end of all the earth. And the leaves thereof were fair, the fruit thereof much. And in it was meat for all. The, the beasts of the field had shadow under it. And the fowls of heaven, of the heaven, dwelt in the bowls thereof. And all flesh was fed of it. I saw in the vision of my head. Upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and an holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said, Thus hew down the tree, cut down the tree, and cut, cut off its branches, shake off its leaves, and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it, and the fowls from his branches nevertheless leave the stump of, the, of his roots in the earth, even with a bunch of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field. And let it be wet of the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the field. Let his heart be changed from man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him. And let seven times pass over him. This matter is by the decree of the watchers. And the demand by the word of the holy ones. To the intent, to the end, for the purpose so that the living may know. That's the most high rulers in the kingdom of men. And giveth it to whomsoever he will. And setteth up over it the business of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now thou, O Belshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation but thou art able for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee that's the dream that nebuchadnezzar had god was trying to show him something to reveal to him what is life at earned? That is what the accumulation of all his actions, 
of all his practices, of his lifestyle, of his behavior, of his running the kingdom, his attitude, his actions, what they all sum to, that now the judgment was going to come. And the Lord revealed each to him. This dream was not revealed to Daniel. It was not Daniel's dream. It was Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Well, we know that this is not the first time Nebuchadnezzar was going to have a dream. He had a dream before. But that was a dream of kingdoms. The kingdom of Babylon. And then the Middle Persian kingdom. And the Grecian kingdom. And the Roman kingdom. That's about empire. This is about the man himself. This is about King Nebuchadnezzar himself. The Lord showed him the dream. And the implication of the dream, the interpretation of the dream, that's that judgment is coming. And the judgment was sure. And that, in that dream, he saw this great tree, mighty tree, prosperous tree, a flourishing tree that what the height went right to heaven. And he saw all those branches. And he saw all those fruits. And eventually a watcher, a holy one, came from heaven. And made a great announcement. Cut it down. And cut off all the branches. Till there be nothing. And then let it remain there under the dew. And all the weathers. And all the vicissitudes of all the weather and the circumstances. Until seven seasons. Meaning seven years will pass over it. But he didn't understand. He called all the wise men have a dream. I know it's significant, but I don't know what it signifies. Can you tell me the meaning? No, they could not. They'll never be able to. When God is speaking to you, only those in the spirit will be able to know the proper interpretation of the message of the Almighty God. And then eventually Daniel came and he told Daniel the dream. And he said, Daniel, I know. That you are able to interpret because I know the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. And now Daniel, it's good to have the spirit of God. I said it's good to have the spirit of God. He had the spirit of God and the meaning was very clear to him immediately. In fact, he didn't need to say, King, give me time. I need to go and pray. I need to go and fast. I need to go and seek the face of the Lord immediately because of this relationship interaction he had with the Almighty God. Immediately the Lord revealed to him the meaning of that dream. Verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished. That means surprised, amazed, astonished for one hour. And his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto the heaven. And the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heavens at their habitation. It is thou, O king. Look at the boldness. Look at that frankness, faithfulness. Look at that forthrightness. Without missing words, without fear, without favor, without any fear of man, and without any flattery for the king. He said, it is thou, O king, thou art grown and become strong. For thy greatness is grown and reaches unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher and an holy one coming down from heaven, and saying, Hew the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass. In the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, 
and let his portion be with the bees of the field till seven times seven years pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which is come upon my Lord the king, that they shall drive thee from men. This Daniel is bold. The boldness of a true prophet of God. The authority of a real servant of God. This man was not trembling within. His voice was firm. And the message was clear. He looked at the king and he said, This dream you've got. He said, They shall drive thee from men. And thy dwelling shall be with the bees of the field. And they shall make thee eat grass as oxen. And they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven. And seven times seven years shall pass over thee. Till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men. And giveth it whomsoever he will. And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots. Thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee. After that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. And now he is going to counsel him even after the interpretation of the dream. That's why he says in verse 27. Wherefore, king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee. Break off thy sins. What's he saying? He's saying, Nebuchadnezzar, you are a sinner. This is coming upon you because of your sins. And you can avoid, evade, escape the judgment if you will repent and turn away from sin. Therefore, he said, point blank, a pungent message and a pointed message. He said, break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. If it may be a lightning of thy peace, thy tranquility. You'll find in this first chapter of Daniel that it's a turning point in the life of Nebuchadnezzar. In the experience of Nebuchadnezzar, in the history, the lifestyle of Nebuchadnezzar. The chapter is a personal account given by Nebuchadnezzar himself. You've seen that, as I said, I, 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 a lot of times there. And then we find a summary of the lesson learned from the whole experience. It's expressed in verse 37. Look at verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth. And it's ways judgment. And those that walk in pride, tell me the rest, is able to abase. Nebuchadnezzar learned the final lesson. That's the lesson he should have learned first. But he waited until the judgment came upon him before he learned the lesson. Eventually, he said, those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. But then in, in this experience that he had, he had quite an understanding now, a revelation now of who God is. And he tells us about who God is. In verse 2, he calls God the, most, the high God. And then in verse 17, in verse 25, he says, The most high who rules in the kingdom of men. He's not getting understanding about who God is. This is the man. This is the monarch. This is the king. This is the creature that has said, Who is that God that will deliver you out of my hand? Now he knew that this God, he knew the existence of that God. The power of that God, the majesty of that God, the authority of that God, the greatness of that God. He knew that all power belongs to him and he calls him the most high that ruleth in the kingdom of men. He says, it's him that liveth forever. And then he says, him whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. Then he says, his kingdom is from generation to generation. In fact, as he goes on in his knowledge and understanding about who God is, he calls him the king of heaven. 
And it says, all his works are truth, and his ways judgment. And then he tells us in verse 35 of this chapter, he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. It says, the most high is that one with whom all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou. The major thing we're learning here is that God humbled Nebuchadnezzar because of his pride. And the scripture has a lot to say because God hates pride. And he said eventually those who walk in pride, he, the almighty God, is able to abase. Pride is a terrible evil and sinful. It's very sinful in God's sight. And he always judges pride severely. Pride is destructive. And pride is condemned by God throughout the scriptures and throughout the history of man. Why don't you turn to your Bible and just let me show you some verses of scripture. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. These things does the Lord hate. Ye seven are an abomination unto him. Number one, a proud look. A proud look. Even the look when it's pride, motivating that pride, motivating that look, that is something that is terrible in the sight of the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 16, open your Bible, don't just look at it on the outline, because you cannot mark it on the outline and keep it permanent, but you can mark it in your Bible. In Proverbs chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 5. Everyone that is proud, without exception, a Pharaoh, a Nebuchadnezzar, and Herod, and Absalom, and Ahithophel, anyone who is there, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, it shall not be unpunished. I'm looking at verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction. Pride goeth before destruction. And he holds his spirit before a fall. I'm looking at chapter 18, verse 12. Proverbs 18, verse 12. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. Before destruction, before discipline, before chastisement, and before punishment, the heart of man is haughty. Chapter 21, verse 4. And high look, and a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked is seen. A proud look, a high look, it's seen. And then it says, a proud heart is seen. And God judges that severely. Chapter 29, I'm looking at verse 23. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 23. A man's pride shall bring him low. The people of the world who don't understand, they think that when you brag and boast and when you are proud, that will exalt you, that will promote you. They say if you don't blow your trumpet, nobody else will blow it for you. Therefore, blow your trumpet. Be proud, brag, and be boastful. But that will bring you low. It says a man's pride shall bring him low. In Isaiah chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 11. Isaiah 13, verse 11. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease. And will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. And you see what God is saying. He's saying he's going to bring judgment upon those who are proud. And that's what the Lord is telling us from this story, from this life experience of Nebuchadnezzar. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Matthew chapter 23 verse 12. Matthew chapter 23. Verse 12, both Old Testament, both the Old Testament and the New Testament condemns pride very clearly and directly. Matthew chapter 23 verse 12, and whosoever, think about that, whosoever, Herod, no matter how high Pharaoh, no matter how great Nebuchadnezzar, no matter how powerful, and whosoever shall exalt himself 
shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be what? Exalted. Luke chapter 1 verse 51. Luke chapter 1. We're looking at verse 51. He has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has scattered, destroyed all the plans of the proud. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. James chapter 4. In James chapter 4 verse 6. James 4 verse 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud. God resisteth the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. In First Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy chapter 3, we're looking at verse 6. Not a novice. It's talking about those who want to be bishops and preachers and pastors and overseers and Christian leaders. It says we shouldn't choose those who are novices. Whatever talent or skill they have, their skill, their talent will instigate them and push them to be proud. Those who don't have real experience in the Lord and grace in the Lord. Whatever they do, when they do well, they're so filled with pride. It says nothing of this. Let's be lifted up with pride. You fall into the condemnation of the devil. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. You can see that all over the Bible, pride is condemned. And pride will earn people judgment, terrible judgment and fierce judgment. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 21. And upon his set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God, and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory. And he was eating of worms, and gave up the ghost. You'll see then what God has to say about pride. And that's the lesson that we're learning from Nebuchadnezzar today because the judgment of God eventually came because of the pride of his heart. We're going to divide the study today to three parts. Number one, personal testimony to the immutable great judge. Personal testimony to the unchanging, immutable, unalterable great judge. Number two, the prosperous proud tree and its impending great judgment. That's the dream. The tree, the flourishing tree, the prosperous tree that eventually experienced the judgment of the great God, the great judge. Number three, prophetic truth of an imminent great judgment. Welcome to point number one. Point number one, personal testimony. To the immutable great judge. Let's look at chapter 4 of Daniel. I'm reading from verse 1. Daniel chapter 4. Verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you. As you think about this first verse, and he said, Peace be multiplied unto you. This is Nebuchadnezzar writing to all people, all nations, and all languages. The heart which had been filled with the pride of power. This man was proud, and pride filled him up. His intestine, his heart, his spirit, his soul, his mind, his every part, his mouth, his words, his attitude, his look, his dressing, his comportment, everything was full of pride. But now he said, I'm now 
talking about peace, peace towards all. The change was produced by divine chastisement and overpowering grace. Its discipline was severe, but it produced a positive, remarkable result. He learned more about God. He learned more about how to live, how to comport himself with the beast than he ever learned among men. Now he makes a proclamation. To make known the wonderful dealings of God towards him. It was the most humiliating experience. I've read it to you already. How the judgment was going to come. Yet a wonderful transformation of character was its salutary effect and benefit. He said, I thought it good. To show the signs and the wonders that the high God has wrought towards me. His testimony was effectively that he must increase, but I must decrease. Can I tell you something? Many people, if they went through an experience like this, a humiliating experience, they do not want to give testimony about that. You know, people only give testimony about God prospered me, God enriched me, and God promoted me, and God healed me. They don't give testimony about God's chastisement, about God's punishment. They don't give testimony about how they were proud, and then the punishment came upon them, and as a result of that punishment and chastisement, now the Lord has turned, turned them around, and there is real reformation, transformation, a real cleanse, a real change in their lives. Nobody, many people don't give testimonies like that, but you see, people in Bible days, they said, I was chastised, I was afflicted, I was punished for my pride, for my evil. And as a result of that humiliating discipline, now a change has come upon me. Let's learn a lesson from that. Look at Psalm 73. We're looking at Psalm 73, verses 1, 2, and 3. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. You see this man here is giving testimony and said, truly God is good. God is good. Not because he had money, not because he was healed, not because he was delivered, but because he learned a lesson. What lesson did he learn? Look at verse 22. So foolish was I and ignorant I was, I was as a beast before thee. He said, now I confess. I came to the sanctuary of the Lord and the Lord showed me my foolishness. And I'm praising God because of that. You see, that's how they testified in Bible days. We're looking at, uh, we're looking at uh, Psalm 119. And then you'll see how these people testified. Chastisement came, yes. Punishment came, yes. Discipline came, yes. But that discipline brought me low. That discipline made me to realize I am nothing but God is all in all. That discipline, a kind of expunge or push out pride from me. I'm praising the Lord because of that. Now I have a good relationship with the Lord because of that chastisement and because of that punishment. That is a testimony. We're looking at Psalm 119 verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, after that affliction, have I kept thy word. Look at that kind of testimony. He said, before I was afflicted, when I was soundly a uh, whole, and then I was rich, everything was going on for me, I was, like, I was careless. I went astray. But then affliction came, punishment came, chastisement came, rebuke and reproof came from the Lord. And that reproof and rebuke has corrected me. But now, have I kept thy words? Psalm 71. In Psalm 71, we're looking at verse 15. Now Nebuchadnezzar was ready to praise the Lord after the chastisement, after the punishment, after the change and the transformation that came upon him. Now he was ready to praise the name of the Lord. Psalm 71 verse 15. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day, for I know not the numbers thereof. 
I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. O God, thou hast taught me from my youth. And hitherto have I declared thy wondrous words. Now also when I'm old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to everyone that is to come. Thy righteousness also, o God, is very high. Who has done great things, so God, who is like unto thee. Similar to what Nebuchadnezzar was saying, he published his own to all people, all nations, all languages, said, you must hear this, you must know this. Because I was a sinner, I was proud, full of pride. I even went as far as saying, who is that God? But the Lord brought me low. Now I understand who God is, and I want everybody to know who that great God God of heaven is. Psalm 72. In Psalm 72 verse 17, it says his name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God. The God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things. And blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. We're looking at Psalm 76. You see these people in Bible days, how they glorify the Lord. How they worship the Lord. When they were rebuked, they glorified the Lord. Oh Lord, thank you for the rebuke. I merited that. I needed that to caution me. I needed that to bring down my proud heart. When they were chastised, when they were disciplined, and when they were humiliated, they said, Oh God, thank you very much. I've learned a lesson in my humiliation, which I never learned in my exaltation. And that humiliation has now brought me closer to the Lord. That's why they were praising the Lord. And we who are living today, and we who are worshipping God today, we need to learn the same lesson that everything, when the rain falls, praise the Lord for that. When it's sunshine, praise the Lord for that. And when God withdraws something from you, so that he can teach you a lesson that he is the all in all, and he is the one that you need, you praise the Lord for it. We're not only praising the Lord when there's healing. What is humiliation? chastisement, correction, rebuke. We're praising the Lord because that draws us to the Lord and that moves us to pray. I pray that you'll be praising the Lord every time. We're looking at Psalm 86, 86, reading from verse 8. Psalm 86, verse 8. Among the gods, there is none like unto thee, O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name, for thou art great and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. In, in Isaiah chapter 25, Isaiah 25, Reading from verse 1, Isaiah chapter 25, verse 1. O Lord, thou art my God, I will exalt thee, I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things, thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. You know what he's saying here? He's saying, I'm praising the Lord. I'm glorifying the Lord. Why are you praising the Lord? Because man has disappointed me. And now I know that I need God. Man has disappointed me. Now I know my prosperity and my provision is in praying to the God of heaven. Why are you praising God? I now see the uselessness of pride. And then I see the importance of humility. Why are you praising God? I'm praising God because I know now I am nothing. And God is all all in all, and that drives me to my knees, and that drives me to the Lord. I'm praising the Lord because I see the beauty of God, and the glory of God, and the majesty of God, and the honor of God more than ever before. I'm praising the Lord because my need has made me to see how great God is, how wonderful God is. When I was strong, and healthy, and happy, and rich, I didn't know that I needed God, but when poverty came, when joblessness came, when difficulty came, when rebuke came, 
when my friends forsook me, when men could not have any help for me, then I remembered I can pray. And the promises of God became real unto me. I'm praising God because my problems have driven me onto my knees and unto the Lord. That's how those people of Bible days, that's how they praise the Lord because of what their problems did in their lives. They were not groaning and murmuring and complaining because of their problems. They were praising the Lord because those problems became profitable for them and drove them to their knees and drove them to know the Lord more and more. In Daniel chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 34. Daniel chapter 4, we're looking at verse 34. And at the end of the days, I, Daniel, image, at the end of the days of my chastisement, at the end of the days of my trouble, at the end of the days of my rebuke, at the end of the days of being torn to bees, to eat grass like an animal, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, I Bless the most high. I didn't complain. I didn't say, God, why did you do that to me? I knew why he did that to me. I knew he had to humiliate me. My pride was so much. I had the servants of God with me. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their lives could not turn me to God. I saw miracle of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego passing through the fire. All that did not change me. I saw the miracle of revelation that Daniel was able to recollect my dream. And was able to tell me everything. That did not change me, but this one in the hand of God that was very heavy on me and humiliated me, that changed me, and it is the greatest sin that ever happened to me. When I saw Daniel revealing that dream, and God is the revealer of secrets, did I know God is great? Yes, I knew God is great, but that didn't change me. When I saw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego passing through the fire, did that impress me? Yes, I was impressed, but that did not convert me, but this one, when the Lord taught touch me and then transform me to an animal and I ate grass and then the dews of heaven came upon I knew that this God he can turn a monarch to a maniac I know that this God if you are not very careful if you are proud he can bring you so down so low you will not know yourself now I lifted up mine eyes and I bless the God of heaven who liveth forever and ever whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation verse 35 and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing I thought I was great. I thought there was nobody like me. I thought like that tree, I was already grown tall to the heavens until I was brought down. Now I know that all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, Watch doest thou. At the same time, my reason returns unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors, and my and my Lord sought unto me. You know, he said, you know what surprised me of all things? That all those seven years I was under punishment and chastisement, nobody took over my throne. The sea was just vacant there. None of the counselors and none of the captains and none of the princes said, ah, the man is mad. The man is an animal. Let us vote again. Let us replace him. He said, this God is wonderful. He retained my position for me. All he was waiting for was that I would be humble. And with that humiliation and humility now, when I came, they were even seeking me. Do you know something? None of the journalists even wrote about it. And none of the people started campaigning saying the man became an animal are you going to accept everybody accepted me back he said this is a great god this has convinced me that this god is the most high god then he said i was established in my kingdom and excellent majesty was added unto me now i nebuchadnezzar praise and extol and honor the king of heaven all whose words are truth and it's waste judgment. And those that walk in pride, he is able, he is able to abase. He said, now, you know, in my foolishness, I, I was asking, I said, if I throw you into the fire, 
Who is that God? He said, I'm not asking questions anymore. I swallow my saliva. I swallow my pride. I swallow my words. Now I know he that walketh in pride, this mighty God of heaven is able to abase. I pray that the lesson that he has learned with you, we will learn it without going through what he went through in Jesus' name. This God is an awesome God, a glorious God, a mighty God, the most high God. He's glorious in holiness, he's fearful in praises, and he's glorious in power. He made this proud and presumptuous creature who felt himself more than a God, less than the meanest of his subjects, less than a man. After the creator had reduced the creature to nothing, he knew, he knew God and glorified him as God. He said, his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. He said his dominion is from generation to generation. Truly, Nebuchadnezzar's haughty spirit was replaced by a humble spirit. Before humiliation, he said, is this, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom of my might, of the might of my power. But after his humiliation and transformation, he declared the kingdom of God is an everlasting kingdom. I pray that that same revelation, you'll have it in Jesus' name. We come to point number two now. Point number two, the, pers- the prosperous proud tree. And it's impending great judgment. Prosperous, proud tree. And it's impending great judgment. Already we have read it is in Daniel chapter 4. And it's from verse 4 all through to verse 18. That is the dream. But I, I just need to tell you that God pictured Nebuchadnezzar with this picture of a tree. You know something, Daniel, because Daniel knew the scriptures, it was very easy for Daniel to interpret. He knew that God compares wicked people onto a tree. And he knew what the problem really was. He knew from the scriptures, if you read the scriptures now, you will see what the real problem was. It was more pride. And this was a tree that had grown tall up to heaven. And then he was so proud now of himself. He thought, this is my achievement. This is my empire. This is my kingdom. This is my possession. These are my subjects. Everybody bowing down to me. And then Daniel knew the purpose of God in giving him the dream. He wanted to cancel the pride of his heart. We're looking at Job chapter 33. Job chapter 33 and we're reading from verse 14. Job chapter 33 verse 14. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed. Then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction. Daniel knew that the dream that God gave Nebuchadnezzar, God was trying to give him some instruction. What kind of instruction? Verse 17. That she may withdraw man from his purpose. That she may withdraw Nebuchadnezzar from his purpose. Nebuchadnezzar wanted to replace God in the minds of the people. He had raised up an image. A picture of himself. And he wanted the people to worship the image. And he wanted the people to worship him. He wanted to set up himself as the object of worship. And God withdrew man from his purpose. And to hide pride from man. That's the whole purpose. That's the goal. That's the reason why God showed him that dream. And that was the intention of God. Why God brought all that upon him. To hide pride. From man, and then he used the picture of a tree. Look at Psalm 37. Psalm 37. We're looking at verse 35. I have seen the wicked in great power spreading himself like a green bay tree. That's it. That's scripture. 
And if you know the scriptures, you'll understand that that tree that uh, Nebuchadnezzar saw, it was his picture. It was a picture of this great flourishing man. And then he said, yet he passed away. And lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him and he could not be found. You understand that? Nebuchadnezzar was on the throne. Everybody came. When they came, he was always on the throne. He never left the throne. And then God was going to bring this judgment upon him. This was a great tree that had grown so tall and grown so beautiful and grown so prosperous. All the people on, the, on earth, they were under his shadow. And then a time was going to come. They would look for him on the throne. They will not find him. He'll be in the forest. He'll be on the field. He'll be eating grass like the bees. And that's the dream. That's exactly what it says here. Look at it again, verse 35. I have seen the wicked in great power. I've seen the Kadnesa in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree yet he passed away seven seasons nobody could find him on the throne nobody could find him in the palace he, he was out there eating grass like animal it says and lo he was not yea i sought him but he could not be found we're looking at job chapter 8 job chapter 8 for daniel this was easy the interpretation was very clear. If you know God, and if you know man, and if you know that God hates pride, and if you have followed the life of Nebuchadnezzar, and if you know the scriptures that the wicked is likened to a tree, this will be very clear to you that God was going to cut down this man. He was going to cut him down to size. He thought he was as high as heaven, as tall as heaven, as great as a God of heaven. He wanted to make himself a God, and he was filled with pride. And and God said, I'll cut him down to size. I'll show him it's not, as, it's not as tall as heaven. And he cut him down until only the stump remained on the ground. And he made him to go and eat grass, not looking up, but looking down like an animal. That's what God is saying, that the judgment was coming. In Job chapter 8, reading from verse 13. Job chapter 8, verse 13. So, at the pass of fall that forget God. And the hypocrite's hope shall perish, whose hope shall be cut off, and whose trust shall be a spider's web. He shall lean upon his house, but it shall not stand. He shall hold it fast, but it shall not endure. He is green. That's talking about the tree now. Before the sun, and its branch shooted forth in its garden. Its roots are wrapped about the heap. He sees the place of the stones. In verse 18, if he destroy him from his place, then it shall deny him, saying, I have not seen thee. What is Nebuchadnezzar? They ask the counselors, I have not seen him. You see not in the palace? No, he's not here. The Lord cut him down. That's what he's saying. That's the judgment that was coming. In verse 19, behold, this is the joy of his way. Out of the earth shall others grow. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 31. In Ezekiel chapter 31, we're looking at what the Lord is saying about the wicked that grow like the tree. And then eventually, because of their pride, the Lord cuts them down. They're humiliated and humbled. It says in Ezekiel chapter 31 verse 3, Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar. That's another kind of tree. In Lebanon, with fair branches and with shadowy shouts. And it says, And of an high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. The waters made him great. The deep set him up on high with her rivers running around about his plants and sent out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. Therefore, his height was exalted above all the trees of the field and his bows were multiplied and his branches became long because of the multitude of waters when he shot forth. All the fowls of heaven made their nest in his bowl. And then it says, And under his branches did all the bees of the field bring forth their young. And under his shadow dwelt all great nations. Thus was he fair in his greatness. 
in the lanes of his branches, for his root was by great rivers. The cedar in the garden of God could not hide him, could not overshadow him. Then it says, and the fir tree were not like his bows, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. What he's saying is that when you even compare the people that know the Lord, the righteous people, the Israelites, they were not even as prosperous as this man. They, they are not as powerful as this man. And yet that now made him proud. I'm greater than the Israelites. I'm greater than the people of God. I'm greater than the righteous. If they say I'm a sinner, if they say I'm wicked, yet I have more money, I have more riches, I have more property, I have everything. That's what he's saying, but keep on reading. I have made him fear by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because thou hast lifted up thyself in height. Pride comes in. When sinners become rich, they become proud. When, uh, when, the, when the sinners become, when they become uh, successful, they become proud. They begin to boast and they begin to brag. And there's nobody like them anywhere. And God says, Now therefore does says the Lord God, because thou hast lifted up thyself in height, and he has shut up his top among the thick bows, and his heart is lifted up in his height. I have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen. He shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness. That's exactly what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. He became so proud. Don't you worship my image? I give you another chance. Understand that I'm the greatest one. I'm the king of all the earth. And if I set up an image and I tell you to worship, if you don't bow down and worship, I'll cast you into the fire. And who is that God that will deliver you? Out of my hand. He knew neither man nor God, respected neither man nor regarded God because of his greatness. And God said, I'll deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness. In verse 12, and strangers, the terrible of the nations, have caught him off and have left him upon the mountains and in all the valleys his branches are falling and his bows are broken by all the rivers of the land. And all the people of the earth have gone down from his shadow and have left him. There's no shadow anymore because it is caught down. And then we're told in verse 13, upon his ruin shall all the fowls of heaven remain. And all the beasts of the field shall be upon his branches. Now, but as we look at Daniel chapter 4. We're told that the tree was to be cut down, but the storm will remain. And then after that, it will grow again. Let's come back to Daniel. Daniel chapter 4. This was not a final judgment. This was not an eternal judgment. It was an earthly judgment. It was a temporary judgment so that he will learn the lesson that he ought to learn. And after learning the lesson, then God will restore him again. Isn't God a wonderful God? He hates pride, but when the proud becomes humble, he said, that's all right. That's what, that's what I'm driving at. That's all I'm looking for. And since the pride is gone, why will you keep the punishment there? Since the man is humiliated now, and he says, I recognize the God of heaven, why will you still keep him out there? And that's how God deals with us. When God is rebuking you for something, punishing you for something, chastising you for something, and say, Lord, I'm sorry about that. I was proud. I thought I was all in all. I thought I was untouchable. I thought that, you know, I was just there. and Nobody could say anything to me, but now I realize that even though I'm greater than all men, but God is greater than me, and God has cut me down to size. Lord, I'm sorry. That's the end. Then the punishment will cease. The punishment will stop. The chastisement will come to an end. And then you'll be able to come back to where you were before. I pray the mercy of God be real in every life in Jesus' name. Daniel chapter 4. I'm looking at verse, I'm looking at verse 17. This matter is by the decree of the watchers. 
and the demands of, of the, by the word of the holy ones to the intent. That means to the purpose in order that the living may know that the most high rulers in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over each the basest of men. Verse 24, verse 25. This is the interpretation, O king. And this is the decree of the most high, of the most high, which is come upon my Lord, that they shall drive thee from men. And thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And they shall make thee eat grass as oxen. And they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven. Seven times shall pass over thee. Till thou know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men. And giveth thee to whomsoever he will. When you know that, it will be all over. When you realize God is great and you are small. God is everything, you are nothing. God is God and you are man. God is the creator and you are a creature. And that you have no reason to be proud in the sight of God. Once you realize that everything will be over. Let's look at point number three now as we look at the interpretation of this dream that the Lord had given unto Nebuchadnezzar prophetic truth of an imminent great judgment. We're looking at verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished, astonished and amazed and surprised for one hour and his thoughts troubled him. When he saw, when he had the dream, and he knew the implication of what the king was saying, and he knew what it meant for Nebuchadnezzar, he was a man of compassion, a man of mercy, a man of tenderness, and he knew that this judgment will come upon Nebuchadnezzar. He could have said, well, serves him right. He threw my friends into the fire, and only God delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, my companion. It serves him right. He was bragging and boasting, and now judgment is coming, but not that. Daniel. Daniel was a person that had tenderness. And what a lesson for us who are preachers. When we preach about judgment, when we preach about the, fav- the fire of God coming upon the unbeliever, we should say that with tenderness. We should preach that with mercy. And we shouldn't act as if we're so happy this is coming upon the sinner. You know, some people, when they preach about hell, they preach as if they even rejoice that people are going to hell. They talk about hell and they laugh and they're happy and they say those sinners, they're going to hell, but not Daniel. Daniel was tender. Daniel was solved. He was bothered for this man. He was troubled for Nebuchadnezzar that this judgment was coming upon him. Of course, we know that Daniel was bold. Daniel was firm. Daniel was faithful. His fidelity had no equal. It was an uncommon kind of faithfulness. He still told the king the interpretation of the dream. And he said, this is what will happen. But he said it to attend Daniel. He's teaching us that when we tell the truth, we tell the truth in love, we tell the truth with tenderness, and we're almost crying because of the judgment and the chastisement coming upon the unbeliever. We're not saying those things as if we're very happy and we're rejoicing that this terrible thing was going to come upon Nebuchadnezzar. When you're witnessing, when you're preaching, and when you're, when you're sharing the word of God with sinners, even the most terrible of sinners, even the most wicked of sinners, even the people that will not deserve the judgment of God. We're not preaching to them as see my heart, this is coming upon you. How happy I am. I'm the one that is making this proclamation and prophecy and you're going to really suffer because you're a real terrible person. No. There should be that tenderness and softness and love as we declare the truth of God. Yes, we don't minimize the judgment. And we do not, uh, or we don't uh, kind of change the word of God. And we don't become unfaithful in not telling the people the truth, but we tell the truth in love. Look at verse 19, the second part. And then it says, his thoughts troubled him. And the king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, my lord, the dream be to them that hate thee. And the interpretation thereof to thine enemies the tree that thou sowest which grew and was strong 
whose height reach unto the heaven, and the sides thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fear, and the fruits thereof much, and in each was the meat for all, under which be under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven at their habitation. It is thou, O king. It is thou, O king. And everything you saw, everything you heard, that that tree will be cut down, and that tree will be will have its, its heart changed, and the heart of man will be taken away, and the heart of the beast will be given to it, and that beast will be driven out to go and eat grass, and the dew of heaven will fall upon that beast, and then seven seasons and seven times seven years will pass over that individual. It is thou, O king, thou art great, thou art grown and become strong. For thy greatness is grown and reaches unto heaven. Everybody is turning about it. And thy dominion to the edge of the earth. And whereas the king saw the watcher and an holy one, a messenger from heaven coming down from heaven. And saying, hew down the tree, destroy it. Yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion, let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven times, seven seasons, seven years pass over him. This is, is interpretation, O king. This is the decree of the Most High which is come upon my Lord the King. It says, you're going to be humiliated and you're going to be driven away from, uh, from the men around you. Is that strange? Is that something new? Again, when you know the scriptures, the interpretation is very clear. Because God had said this before. He was going to bring the judgment upon Babylon. He was going to bring the judgment upon Nebuchadnezzar. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 50. Jeremiah chapter 50. I'm reading verse 29. Jeremiah chapter 50 verse 29. Call together the archers against Babylon. And all ye that bend the bow, camp against it round about. Let none thereof escape. Recompense her according to her work. According to all that she has done, do unto her. For she has been proud against the Lord, against the Holy One of Israel. You see, Jeremiah had said it before Daniel. He had said because of his pride, he has been proud against the Lord, against the Holy One of Israel. Look at verse 31. Behold, I'm against thee, O thou most proud. And if you knew anybody proud, very proud in Babylon, that was Nebuchadnezzar. And God said, Behold, I'm against you, O thou most proud, says the Lord God of hosts, for thy day is come, the time that I will visit thee, and the most proud shall stumble and fall, and none shall receive all. You see that? And Daniel knew the word of God, and then with this dream, Daniel just knew the time of the fulfillment of that dream must now come. And let's come back to Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 16. In Proverbs chapter 16, reading from verse 5. It says, everyone that is proud, Nebuchadnezzar included, you and I included, if we're proud, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. And there are various ways of punishment. There are various kinds of punishment. Who knew that any punishment like this could happen unto anybody, unto a man, unto Nebuchadnezzar? Look at your Bible from Genesis to Daniel. Nothing like this had ever happened. But God has a thousand and one ways, a million and one ways to bring punishment, chastisement, wrath, judgment, indignation upon the proud and this strange punishment came upon him because of his evil and let's look at verse 18 it says in verse 18 pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall 
And that's what came upon him eventually. He, had, he was the bragging one, the proud one, the, the boastful one. And now the judgment of God came. It's a warning for you, it's a warning for me that no matter who we are, and no matter our achievement, and no matter our station in life, and no matter our position in life, no matter our possession in life, we should be humble before the Lord. What has thou got that was not given unto thee? And if it was given unto you, what are you boasting about? Be humble in the sight of the Lord. Psalm 12, I'm reading verses 3 and 4. Psalm 12, verses 3 and 4. It says in Psalm 12, verse 3, The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. That's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. The Lord shall cut off the mouth that speaketh proud things. He who gave, who, who have said, with our tongue, we will prevail. And with our own, our, our, our lives are our own, who is Lord over us. That's the problem he had, that Nebuchadnezzar, who is Lord over him. He was the all in all, and nobody could control him. And because of that, God said, I'm bringing punishment upon you. And that punishment will not be a punishment you are familiar with. It will be a kind of punishment you have never, never seen in your life. It will be like a strange punishment. I pray that God will preserve us from pride. And God will preserve us then from all the punishment coming upon the proud people in Jesus' name. The Lord wants us to humble ourselves so that the strange punishment will not come upon any of us. We're looking at uh, Isaiah chapter 13 once again. Isaiah chapter 13. In Isaiah chapter 13, we're reading there from verse 11. Isaiah chapter 13, we're looking at verse 11. And I will punish the world for the evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease. When that punishment comes, when that chastisement comes, God says, the bragging, the haughtiness, the pride, the haughtiness, everything will come to an end and, and we lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. We're looking at Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4, we're reading from verse, uh, from verse 1. Malachi chapter 4, reading from verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the, all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But then, is there any remedy? After all, God has said, I'm going to cut it out. The watcher, uh, the, ho the holy one from heaven made the announcement and made the decree and the demand. Cut it down. And then you could be wondering now, is there any remedy at all? Is there anything that Nebuchadnezzar could have done to avoid that judgment so that it will not come? Let's come back to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4, we're looking at verse 27. Wherefore, king... Let my counsel be acceptable unto thee. O king, don't say, let what will be, be. Don't say, is God? Let him do what he wants to do. Don't say, okay, since you have announced that judgment is coming, I'm waiting. Let you come. Let me see what that God can do. It says, don't talk like that. Don't think like that. But surrender yourself to God. See what it says in verse 27. It says, King, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins. Break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy unto the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. And that's what we need to learn when God declares judgment. When God says, I'm bringing this upon the land. I'm bringing this upon the sinner. I'm bringing this upon the backslider. Judgment is coming. We shouldn't have the attitude, all right, God has said so, that judgment is coming. Let what will be, be. No, look at Jeremiah chapter 18. 
In Jeremiah chapter 18, we see the way of God, the dealings of God with man. When he announces judgment, if we will repent, if we will turn, if we will change and then become humble in the sight of the Lord, God says, I'm ready to overlook everything you've done. I'm ready to forgive. I'm ready to forget and forbear. And then I'm ready to cancel the judgment, the pronouncement, and the predicted Ross and indignation that has said, I'm going to bring upon you. If you will turn, if you re repent, and if you come out from that seat of pride, and you come to the side of the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry for that pride. There's nothing to boast of in the sight of the Almighty God. God says, if you do that, repentance and changing of your mind is all that is looking for. In Jeremiah chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 7. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck it up and to pull down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil. That's all he's looking for. I pronounce judgment and wrath and addition and chastisement. If that nation, that individual, against whom I pronounce turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. We're looking at Jonah. Jonah chapter 3. In Jonah chapter 3, this is exactly what happened. Jonah came to Nineveh and he declared the judgment coming upon Nineveh. The king of Nineveh did not say, okay, let what will be, be. The king of Nineveh did not say, all right, God has decided. That's what he wants to do. Let him go ahead and do it. This will not be the first time. After all, he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Will not be the first one for he destroyed the antediluvian world. After all, all those Canaanites, he destroyed them. And if those people were able to bear the punishment, the chastisement, the destruction, were waiting, God should do what he wants to do. They did have that attitude. They changed. They turned. They repented and they came out of their violence and out of their wickedness and out of their pride. And that is what Nebuchadnezzar could have done and the judgment would not have come. But he waited until the judgment came and seven seasons, seven times and seven years passed before he learned his lesson. I pray it will not be like Nebuchadnezzar. That when the Lord is speaking at this very time, this very day, this very moment, we'll do what the Lord wants and we'll escape the judgment of God in Jesus' name. We're looking at Jonah chapter 3. I'm looking at it from verse 4. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest unto the uh, from the greatest of them even to the least of them for the word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes you see that he humiliated himself he humbled himself he turned away from the evil and then he made a proclamation and he caused it to be proclaimed and published through, through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles saying, let neither man nor beast nor herd nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that will perish not? If we repent, we will not perish. If we turn, we will not perish. If we will give an answer to God, a response to God, and say, God, yes, we know you hate pride, and you're turning us away from our pride. Lord, we're sorry. And then we come, and we're humble before the Lord. The Lord will have mercy on us in Jesus' name. And God saw, verse 10, God saw their words, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he said, that he had said, that he would do unto them, and he did it not. He did it not. 
Can God cancel the judgment? Can he reverse the negative prophecy? On what condition? Repentance. We're looking at First Kings chapter 21. First Kings chapter 21. I'm reading to you there from verse 11. First Kings chapter 21. Let's come to verse, instead of verse 21, let's come to verse 17. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he is gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus says the Lord, as thou killed, and also taken possession, and thou and thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus says the Lord, In the place where the dogs leak, the blood of neighbor shall the dogs leak, thy blood even thine. And he hath said unto Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? That's the, that's the attitude he had. When Elijah came, you found me, you have discovered me, uh-huh. I know why you are coming, you are my enemy, you will never support me. That's what he thought about this prophet of righteousness. And then he said, he said, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to walk evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee. And will take away thy posterity, and will cut off from Ahab him that pierceth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel, and will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, and like the house of Beersha the son of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. God said, Ahab, I'm angry with you. You have provoked me to anger by the evil deeds in your hand. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. And him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the hem of the air eat. And then it goes on like that. Look at the look at the result. When Ahab had that, Ahab did not say, as wicked as Ahab was, as hard-hearted as Ahab was, Ahab did not say, I know that's what you'll say. I know that's the message you always have. I know you don't have to say anything good about me. I know you are the hard preacher. You are the hard prophet. I know that's what you will say. Okay, let God do what he will do. He didn't say that. But look at this in verse 27. And it came to pass when Ahab had those words, that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went how softly. Ahab of all people. You don't want Ahab to be better than you are. When Ahab had the judgment coming upon him, then he went softly. He changed. He turned around. And the word of the Lord, verse 28, came to Elijah, the Jehovah, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbles himself before me? That's all I'm looking for. See how far Ahab had gone. See how terrible things Ahab had done. And yet God said, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his day. God is a God of mercy. It's a God of love. If we will turn whatever judgment the Lord has pronounced, that judgment will not come again. And it's as simple as that. Just repent and turn to the Lord. There will be no judgment again. The mercy of God will be sure and definite for every one of us in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. We have had a lot today. We have seen that God hates pride. Arrogance. God hates that. And God hates any attitude of rejecting the word of God and rejecting the pronouncement of the Lord. And then he brings judgment, furry indignation, furry wrath against the people who are proud. Proud in the heart, proud in attitude, proud in comportment, proud in outlook, proud as they brag, and proud when they boast. God hates it. And now he says, judgment is coming. Because of the pride, Daniel was not able to discipline Nebuchadnezzar, but God brought him down. 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not in position to discipline Nebuchadnezzar. But God brought him down. Moses could not chastise or discipline Pharaoh. But God brought Pharaoh down. Peter, James, John could not discipline Herod. But God smote him through that angel. God can deal with anyone. No one is above God. Men may not be able to punish. Men may not be able to chastise. Men may not be able to discipline an individual. There is a God in heaven that disciplines sin, sinners, chastises them, and brings them low. You want to tell the Lord, Oh Lord, I've had your word. I know you hate pride in every form. And Lord, I come before you. I will not wait until the judgment comes. In the privacy of my heart, in the lowliness of my heart. In whichever way I've been manifesting pride, haughtiness, bragging, boasting. Lord, I turn to you. Forgive and cleanse and change me completely. The little, little things I say, anything that shows pride, Lord, cleanse me. The outlook I have, the posture I carry, the appearance I demonstrate. The attitude I manifest, the thoughts I entertain, thoughts of pride, Lord, I turn, Lord, I repent, Lord, I yield. God does not excuse pride in anyone, at any time, in any way. When the cup of Nebuchadnezzar was full, the predicted judgment came. He neglected, he overlooked, he spawned, he mocked the counsel. Of the man of God. He didn't turn. God gave him chance. God gave him some time. Twelve months passed. And then he was walking. In the palace. Looked over all his achievements. And then the words of pride. Came out of him. It's not this great Babylon that I have built for the majesty of my kingdom by the might of my power. While those words were in his mouth, the verdict came from heaven. And all the predicted judgment came upon him. He could have escaped that if he had been humble, if he had heard, if he had listened. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call you upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way. That the proud forsake his pride. And forsake his thoughts. The thoughts of pride. The language of boasting. The attitude of self-exaltation.
forsake that. And when the Lord sees that we turn from our pride, we turn from our self-exaltation, and we give God the glory, and we are not competing with the Almighty God, Exalting ourselves above God, above the people of God. When we allow self to be crucified and buried, then the Lord will have mercy. You know, He forgives. It's merciful God, loving God, compassionate God. Seek the Lord while he may be found. This time of prayer could reverse the declaration, the pronouncement, the judgment of God upon your head. Turn while the Lord is pleading. Repent. While the Lord is pleading. Remember he is the creator. We are creatures. Remember he is the most high. We are nothing. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. In his sight. My people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways and pray. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. It have changed. Won't you change? The king of Nineveh and the nobles in Nineveh and the people of Nineveh, they changed, they turned. Won't you turn? Won't you change? And eventually, Nebuchadnezzar learned the lesson. He even came now to glorify God, to praise the Lord for the chastisement, for the humiliation, for the discipline. Won't you have the same attitude? Glorify Him, praise Him, honor Him, exalt Him. For the rebuke, for the correction, for the revelation, for the humiliation. For taking you away from the throne. And you know what the Lord is waiting for before he restores you back to that throne? Until you know that the most high rulers in the affairs of men. You know you cannot conquer God. You're a creature. You're a human being. At one stroke. You can deal with you and your pride. Don't strive against God. Don't fight against God. Don't harden yourself against God. 
Nobody ever hardened himself against God and prospered. Turn, repent, seek the Lord. Benefit and profit by the experience of Nebuchadnezzar. Don't wait until it happens to you. Learn from what you see. Learn from what you hear. God resists the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. 